Good morning and <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, by show of hands, who here has scoliosis? Okay, so maybe a third of the room. And who, of, of those who have scoliosis, who has had surgery? A few of you. Good, so you can really give this talk probably better than I can because there's not a lot of data, but we have some, and I think uh, we'll, I'll talk about the, the bit of data that we have and then would love your input. Uh, who is it, who's going to have surgery? Who's uh, expecting to undergo surgery? So nobody in this room. So, okay, got it, all right. So let's, let's get started. Um, and I think I have a unique perspective of uh, treating both a, kids, adolescents, and, and children, and uh, adults as well as does Dr. Erico. So I think that gives me a perspective of those who have undergone surgery and then we see later on in life, or those who have not had surgery and present as an adult with scoliosis. And I'll present a little bit of data on that. And I, I don't want to uh, bump into Dr. George's talk, but I'll, I will, I think the perspective is important. Uh, our patients as a whole present not as a spine, but as an individual. And you know, you're here because you're concerned about the quality of your life over the course of a lifetime, not just as a snapshot in time. And uh, those who have scoliosis understand the concepts of self-image and body image and preserving that. And many of you who have seen surgeons or physicians to discuss uh, your treatment understand that there is a natural history. The curve may progress, it may get worse. And we know that in the adult, Scoliosis is often associated with pain, and that's pr primarily what we treat in the adult. And then in severe cases, there may be lung, lung disease that occurs as well. And we also know that surgery later in life is more risky, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of information on that, because that's part of the discussion. If you have a 50-degree scoliosis, may not hurt very much, you're very active, why should I do this now? I'm not growing any longer. Should I do my surgery? Should I have my surgery now? Or should I wait until I'm an adult and it really starts to bother me and really hurts? So that's a conversation we often have in the office, and many of you may have had that conversation. So I won't get too much into this, but I see the patient as a sort of not just a spine. As I said, in the spine, we can evaluate through x-ray and through body surface uh, topography measurements, which is the body shape. But I think the most important part and really what speaks to function are some of these questionnaires that we use in evaluating uh, our patients. These are quality of life questionnaires that many of you fill out and spend a lot of time doing. I'm not even sure that they're the best questionnaires that speak to your concerns and needs, but I think we're developing new uh, outcomes questionnaires as a group. Uh, we are developing something called a patient-generated index, which will really have the, the individual patient tell us what are the five most important things in their life that they think might be affected and how they want those and they prioritize those as we I want this to be fixed I want this to be better these, these are my f concerns so we're doing a prospective study on that and I think that will get to to the individual patients function and concern because not everybody is a, an elite athlete some people are uh, great students and uh, they play the piano and so there are different concerns and different needs and return to function means something different for every patient um, and then of course time is a, a very important factor and we don't have the best data on that but we have a lot of patients who tell us what their experience has been like so we do know if we don't treat scoliosis the adult patient with scoliosis has more pain and poor self-image and functional problems than uh, an adult that does not have scoliosis. Um, we also know that uh, bigger curves are associated with worse lung function, so the most severe curves. And I won't spend much time on that. And surgery does, in this old study, surgery does improve that, particularly for very large curves. Okay, I told you I would discuss surgery in the adolescent patient versus surgery in the adult. And we did a study uh, recently that we're going to present at the Scoliosis Research Society meeting in the fall, where we took patients from our adult uh, surgical database and compared these to adolescent patients. So we took a 16-year-old girl, let's say, who reached the end of growth, and she had a 50-degree curve at that age and underwent surgery for that. We can also think about that seven or 16-year-old girl 
And what would happen if she didn't have surgery but had surgery 20 or 30 years down the line? And we know there's a natural history of progression. Dr. Weinstein, who's giving the talk on bracing, wrote some of the important papers on that. And so 30 years down the line, that 50 degree curve might be 68 degrees or so. And so what would that surgery experience look like? So we matched those patients side by side and took a look at it. And we found that the adult patient who didn't have surgery as an adolescent but had it later, had more level of fuse, had longer operative time, more blood loss, almost twice as much, 25% major complications versus a much smaller percentage of complications, and more reoperations. So uh, that's a big difference. So what about return to function? And I'll, I'll focus more here on activities and, and some on athletics as well. But some of this has to do with the, the individual's preoperative level of activity. If you were uh, not a, a javelin thrower before surgery, you're probably not going to become a javelin thrower after surgery. And if you didn't play the piano, you're not going to uh, become a concert pianist right after your operation. But it's also about what are your perceptions? Can I re do I want to return to sports? Uh, what about your parents? They're afraid that you're going to ruin what uh, the surgeon just did and corrected your spine. The, 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 the screws and the rods are going to loosen. They're going to break. I don't want you to play that sport anymore. And that's very common. We see that all the time. And then the surgeon has an impact. I let my patients get back beginning to get into uh, activities very early on. Others may delay that. Certainly, the, the surgeons in the past would hold activities off for up to a year in many cases. Conditioning of the individual is important. The type of curve and the number of levels that we operate on and fuse. And I'm not going to talk about the, the other, uh, the non-fusion today. So this is a, a paper, and I, we, we don't have to get uh, into the specifics, but basically the longer what this paper, this study showed, was the longer the fusion down into the lower part of the lumbar spine, the less likely the patients were to return to their uh, to their uh, sport that they had been doing before surgery. And Michelle Marx has taken the lead in our group uh, on looking at range of motion after surgery. So many of our patients and many of you have asked, I'm sure, will I have, will I be stiff as a board? Will I be walking around like a robot? Or will I have uh, maintain, maintenance of motion? So we literally looked at this uh, in our post-operative patients. Here we reported on 100 patients and we had them flex and bend to the left and bend to the right, and then we measured this. Now, you don't have to read all the words or the, or the graph. Essentially, what we found is that uh, the patients were able to continue their motion. Their range of motion was maintained, but it was made up with the remaining levels below that were unfused. So they just had increased motion in those remaining levels. And so the less levels you fuse, the more spread out that motion is. <clears throat> and, you know, different surgeries, different uh, presentations of the patient will impact their ability to do things. So this is a young man I operated on about a year ago. He had a double curve, so we had to fix both of those curves. And you can see his body shape before and after, and he's very satisfied. We were able to uh, save a level, so we work really hard to try to give one extra disc for extra motion. So we like to go to L3 instead of L4 uh, when we have to go into the lumbar spine. And this young man was playing uh, shooting hoops already at three months. And this young lady is not an athlete. She's an actress and a singer. We still try to save as many levels as we can, and we were able to save three. But you can see uh, the changes in body shape. Now, this is a much shorter fusion, a thoracal lumbar curve. We were able to correct that with far fewer levels fused, and this young lady is a cheerleader. And here you can see uh, some of our patients say, boy, that doesn't look very nice at the bottom there in the lumbar spine. You, you left it curved, but in the old days, 15, 20 years ago or even less, we would fuse down to L3 or L4 and leave very few levels of, of motion segments. So now we do a selective fusion just of the thoracic curve to maintain that motion and flexibility. So I rather, for my patients, for myself, my own uh, children, I'd rather have flexibility preserved even at the expense of a small residual curve, which really doesn't look very bad. And this patient was able to do uh, flip turns as a competitive swimmer. Here's a young man I operated on oh, oh, probably 15 years ago now, and he was a, a dancer. Uh, and at that time, we were doing thoracoscopic through the side 
uh, through small incisions, uh, fusion and instrumentation. So far fewer levels fused. We didn't go through the musculature of the back. And that was a very, that re really allowed him to have, maintain his flexibility and he, he went right back to dancing. So what about our post-operative protocol? I only have a, a few more slides. Basically, uh, our patients are in the hospital for somewhere around three or four days. We tell them to do no BLT for three months. Anybody know what BLT is? Exactly. Um, and uh, for non-fusions, we get them back sooner. I'll, I'll allow our patients to get into a swimming pool really just for walking and conditioning and exercise at three weeks once the incision is healed. I prefer that they don't do swimming because I think that can stretch the incision and may make the incision not look as nice. So we try to avoid some of that. And then by three months, we begin uh, physical therapy, trough therapy, and that uh, focuses on core strengthening, flexibility work, and conditioning again. And I think low impact aerobic activities, swimming, biking, even light jogging, et cetera. So no BLT until three months and then we let the BLT occur. So we did a study uh, retrospectively um, looking at return to play in our patients. So we developed this questionnaire uh, lots of questions, and we looked at a few things. Time to return to a sport for the individual. Uh, when did they begin training and when did they reach their full potential? The intensity of that sport, whether it's a, a, a recreational activity or a contact collision sport, for example. And what is the individual's perception of whether they reach their physical potential? Very limited, not limited at all, somewhat. And then hours of play per week. Now this was retrospective. We asked them after the fact, after surgery, and now we're doing a prospective study. Many of the surgeons in, in, in the hospital here today are part of that uh, prospective study. So we had 53 patients, most were girls, age 14. The curve before surgery was 52. We fused almost 10 levels, and the majority were done from the back, from a, a posterior fusion. And what we found is that 91% returned to their sport and 80% 80 per, per, 80 return to the same or higher level of competition, so pretty good. Now, we don't know that the, other one, the ones that didn't return, didn't return because they weren't able to or because uh, the surgeon, uh, well, in my case, we, we let them return, but the family may have held them back or there may have been other factors. So we, we found that most patients return to training uh, in their uh, sport by three months, three to six months, and we're at full, full uh, steam ahead at six to 12 months. And their hours of the sport decrease somewhat from six to 10 to two to six hours per week. And I think we'll have a better understanding when we, when we do this prospectively. The, the individual's physical potential, the, that what they perceived was affected by how low the fusion went. So the lower the fusion, the more limited the patient felt. And here's just a listing of some of the activities people got back to. Uh, football, hockey, martial arts in some cases, uh, running, jogging, a lot of people did that. Uh, taekwondo, kickboxing, tennis, skiing, snowboarding, golf, rowing, weightlifting, horseback riding, uh, soccer, volleyball, basketball, field hockey, hiking, aerobics, dance, yoga in there somewhere, spinning, spin class, yoga, Pilates, Etc. So I'll just leave you with this. This young lady underwent that fusion and was able to do that that tumbling. I'm not sure I really said that was okay because normally I, I don't. I, I that's the one thing I tend to limit in a fusion operation would be uh, gymnastics because of that hyperextension and the major tumbling. But you know she did it and did well. So I think returning to function, um, we know that surgery for uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, we know does a good job of correcting body shape, uh, and it allows us, uh, the, the individual, to avoid the problems that are expected in the adult with scoliosis. Return to full function occurs somewhere between three and six months, or maybe a little longer than that. Um, and I think some of the techniques today are different than what they were even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, sports participation is encouraged and I think uh, is maintained for a wide variety of sports. We try to save a level. Uh, you want us to do, to do that. We, we like to do that as well to main, so that you can maintain your, uh, your function. 
And return to function relies on core strengthening, flexibility, and conditioning. Thank you. Thank you.